Chapter 7. Imre Lakatos, eulogized in England, unforgiven in Hungary. You can still advertise that the devil is coming, for the devil chooses strange shapes to confound the innocent. For example, he may choose the shape of a rationalist from London with a Hungarian accent. Paul Feyerabend. Imre Lakatos is one of the most important philosophers of science of the 20th century. His approach to scientific methodology was very influential, and the contribution he made to the philosophy of mathematics is, according to Ian Hacking, to put it simply, definitive. The subject will never be the same again. It took Lakatos only eight years after receiving his PhD at Cambridge to ascend to the prestigious philosophy chair at the London School of Economics in 1969 after Karl Popper's retirement. Currently, the greatest recognition in the philosophy of science bears his name, the Lakatos Award. Economical with the Truth On the Lakatos Award page on the London School of Economics website, one could until recently click on a link and get access to Lakatos's short biography. The link is still there, but the file is no longer accessible. If you click on Lakatos Biography on the LSE Lakatos webpage, you are now redirected to the webpage of the LSE Philosophy Department. Here are the key parts. Born in Debrecen in Eastern Hungary in 1922, he graduated from Debrecen University in 1944. He then joined the underground resistance against the Nazi invasion of Hungary. After the war, he was active in the Communist Party and played a highly influential role in the Ministry of Education in Hungary's key period of radical educational reform for universal access to higher education on the basis of merit. In 1950, he was arrested and spent the next three years as a political prisoner in Rex labor camp without legal trial. Although there is some truth in these passages, they are mixed with distortions and misleading implications to such a degree that the reader is bound to be led astray. I will mention three points. First, the claim that Lakatos joined the underground resistance against the Nazi invasion of Hungary sounds as if he was engaged in fighting against the German occupation. But this is simply not true. As we can read in one of the main sources about Lakatos's life in Hungary, he in fact firmly rejected a suggestion that members of his secret seminars should engage in anti-fascist resistance. The preprint of Jancis Long's article, The Unforgiven, Imre Lakatos's Life in Hungary, was circulating among philosophers when I was at King's College London in 1999-2000, and it was widely discussed then. It is odd that now, almost 15 years after the article was published, the myth about Lakatos's brave, armed resistance against the Nazis is still being propagated. See the most widely used introduction to the philosophy of science, Peter Godfrey Smith's Theory and Reality, an article by Ian Hacking, 2000, and recent announcements about Lakatos Award recipients, e.g. www.philci.org slash announcements, archive of announcements, 24-ish announcements, archived announcements, 139, Lakatos Award, 2012. Second, it sounds as if Lakatos must have done something praiseworthy if he took part in radical educational reform for universal access to higher education on the basis of merit. But wait, this was all happening immediately after the communist takeover in Hungary, right? And isn't it well known that such radical educational reforms in post-war Eastern Europe never involved meritocracy, but that rather, without exception, they ended with ideological indoctrination, censorship and persecution of remaining bourgeois elements and other enemies of the people. So perhaps there is nothing to celebrate about Lakatos's playing a highly influential role in actions of the Ministry of Education. Indeed, there is evidence that Lakatos should be condemned, not celebrated, for his role in the Ministry of Education. Lakatos worked for the Ministry of Education between 1945 and 1948, and was an active writer supporting the hard party line against the liberal factions to be demolished by Hungarian Prime Minister Matthias Rakosi. During the 1947 to 1948 academic year, Lakatos dedicated himself to helping destroy the distinguished Eötvös College, targeted by the communists because of its resistance to transforming itself into an indoctrination tool like the recently established Georgi College. 
In articles and speeches, Lakatos polemicized against the Yotfos curriculum, intimating that the college provided no significant resistance against the fascists and was unsympathetic to the aims of a people's democracy. The college's goals, argued the young Lakatos, were fundamentally elitist and thus unsupportive of the great social transformation taking place. And in 1950, the Minister of Culture Joseph Revai disbanded Eotfos College. As a reward, Lakatos was sent to study in Moscow. Apparently, the real goal was not to implement universal access to higher education, but rather to destroy an institution of higher learning with a long tradition and excellent academic reputation, and through Gleichschaltung, turn it into yet another gray party-controlled school. Moreover, Lakatos's getting a reward for his effort indicates that his actions were probably regarded as a key part of the successfully accomplished mission. Before his destructive actions at Eotvos College, Lakatos was one of the leaders of a student group, Debrechen University Circle, which not only demanded the dismissal of reactionary professors, but also established a screening committee aiming to cleanse the student body of fascists and reactionaries who had wormed their way into the ranks. Ralph Dahrendorf, former director of the London School of Economics, says Lakatos was reared by the Marxist philosopher Georgi Lukács. In reality, Lakatos's association with Lukács included digging up compromising quotes from Lukács and providing other information to the party ideologue Laszlo Rudas when he attacked Lukács for right deviation in 1949. As a consequence of Rudis's accusations, Lukács was forced out of public life for years. A secret police document kept in the historical archives of the state security services says that Gabor Kovac, Lakos's code name as an informer, gave us valuable information about Georg Lukács' circle. According to the philosopher Agnes Heller, Lukács was aware that Lakatos was helping the party build an ideological case against him and once said resignedly, so much for disciples. And third, the information on LSE's website and elsewhere that Lakatos ended up as a political prisoner in Stalinist Hungary will naturally be interpreted as suggesting this happened because he opposed, or was perceived to oppose, Stalinist policies. In all likelihood, hardly anyone would consider the possibility that he was a political prisoner simply because he was more Stalinist than many of the leaders of the Hungarian Communist Party. But there is evidence that this was exactly the case. It seems, furthermore, that Lakatos actually remained a Stalinist even after leaving prison. Lakatos was expelled from the party and taken into custody by the V Hungarian secret police, possibly because of a plan to denounce Ravai, a communist politician and the minister of culture at the time, as an imperialist agent based on Lakatos's research. Ravai, for Lakatos, was not Stalinist enough. Lakatos nonetheless may still have been cooperating at Reksk with the AV. Lakatos maintained the party line after his release, arguing that Rakushi must have had good reasons for his actions. He continued, as he had for years, to spy and inform on others, including his mentor Arpad Sabo. Recall that after the prisoner's release, the writers and others were opposed in two camps supporting Nagi, reformist communist and Rakushi Stalinist. Lakatos was still a staunch Rakushi backer. Speaking of Arpad Sabo, who was one of his closest friends and a witness at his wedding, Lakatos went so far as to search Sabo's wastebasket in the hope of finding something incriminating. Now, it is surely appalling that Lakatos was forced to spend three years in a labor camp without being tried for any crime. Yet it is unclear why the LSE website would describe this unfortunate episode evasively and misleadingly so as to insinuate an act of anti-totalitarian resistance that in fact did not happen. Murder by suicide. Another key event in Lakatos's life, left out in his LSE biography, that casts an even darker shadow over his character, has to do with his role in the suicide in 1944 of a young woman named Eva Izak. I will present the basic facts of this case by relying on a number of sources including a transcription of the hearings conducted at the political department of the state police in Nagivarad, the city's Romanian name is Oradea, on June 18th and 19th, 1945. This document is appended to a moving essay written by Idzak's sister, Maria Zeman, in which at the beginning she says something striking that will make more sense in a moment. 
Eva was the victim of a cruel age, the age of Hitlerism, but her execution outdid even the most devious methods of execution of the time. During World War II, Lakatos joined the Communist Party and became the unofficial leader of a small underground cell in Nagivarad. One of the cell members was a 19-year-old Jewish woman, Eva Isaac. She, like many other members, was in hiding and had false papers. It was feared she was a particular security risk for the whole group, that she was more likely to be arrested and that she might be forced to disclose information about her comrades. This problem had to be addressed, and there was no doubt about who should be in charge. Imre Lipsitz, Lakatos's original surname, the cell's undisputed leader, as well as the authority on Marxism, political issues, strategy questions, and basically everything else. He didn't disappoint, coming up with a totally unexpected idea, or what one later commentator called an insane proposal. The best way out was for Eva Izak to commit suicide. The proposal was supported by an argument couched by the future LSE professor in terms of Marxist dialectics, which the other members found so compelling that they all immediately voted for it, including Eva's own boyfriend. In that fateful meeting, Lakatos's girlfriend requested that she get Eva's winter coat after her death, which was approved. After poor Eva learned about the decision, she only asked whether there was some other way. As a witness later recounted to the police, Lakatos explained that there was no other solution and that what we prove theoretically, we must also realize in practice, so she had to do it. And she did. She first had to travel to a remote place where her dead body would not be recognized by anyone. She was accompanied by another trusted communist, Nushi Levente, whose duty was to prepare things and make sure there was no change of heart at the last minute. Nusi told us that when he and Eva went to Nagirdu, they looked for a deserted place where no one ever goes. He had the water with him, and then Eva took the poison when it was growing dark already. Nusi told Eva that it would be over in a few moments. After Eva drank it, Eva was so strong and brave that she even asked Nusi when would it be over, but she couldn't finish the sentence because she collapsed, made a rattling sound, and Nusi, allegedly, closed her mouth which was foaming, report of Alphonse Weiss, a member of Lacos's communist cell, police interrogation in 1945. When Elie Wiesel read about the death of Eva Isaac, his comment was, Jews killing Jews, in the midst of the Holocaust, I have never heard of anything like that. The sad thing is that in reality there was no reason whatsoever for Eva Idzak to die. Before her suicide, her sister, also a communist, was doing everything she could to get in touch with her and bring her to a safe place. However, she was unable to make any contact because all communication with Eva had to go through the cell leaders, who even opened her mail. They inexplicably refused to respond in any way to her sister's letters and inquiries. When a good friend of Eva's came to Nagivarad to pick her up and take her to a safe house in another city, this friend was informed that Eva had already left, although she was in fact still there, while the group, under the influence of their forceful leader, was strangely unwilling to consider any alternative to the suicide solution. Furthermore, this way of dealing with comrades who were regarded as a security risk was simply unheard of at the time. Imre Toth, a philosopher of mathematics who was at the end of the war, involved in the same kind of underground activity in Hungary as Lakatos, later said, The death sentence by a perverse suicide, as imposed by Imre Lakatos, was even at this time and in its referential system in flagrant contradiction with all the tactical, political, and moral standards of the underground movement. It was certainly an absolutely subjective invention of Imre Lakatos, and taking into account the Jewish background of Imre Lakatos, it remains a horrible singularity. Lakatos was such a dominating influence on the minds of other group members that they were ready to obey all his instructions unconditionally. In some respects, the atmosphere resembled that of a sect like Jim Jones's infamous People's Temple community in Jonestown. Apparently, even the idea of a collective suicide was mentioned at one point, which shows that in the case of Eva Izak too, this kind of proposal may have been Lakatos's way of testing whether there were any limits to his subordinates' obedience. And when Imre Lipsitz told us on the banks of the Koros River 
that we must also commit suicide, we would have obeyed just as Ava did, but then he laughed to show that it was just a test to see whether or not we would submit. Transcript of the Police Interrogation in 1945. LSE philosopher John Worrell once said Lakatos was an exceptional human being. Information from many sources, some of which has been cited here, confirms this statement, but not in the way Worrell intended. Lakatos's extreme manipulativeness, unscrupulousness, lack of concern for other people, and rigid loyalty to a totalitarian ideology make a combination that is, if not unique, certainly quite rare. Worrell, who is also the convener of the Lakatos Award Committee at LSE, appears to be particularly ill-disposed toward negative personal characterizations of his former teacher. So when on the basis of the aforementioned facts, one scholar described Lakatos as a dangerous thug with something like a criminal record, and who consistently displayed a pattern of dissemblance and cunning across the decades, Worrell called this an appalling, perhaps even libelous remark. Worrell's indignation is misplaced. This allegedly appalling remark seems to be tracking the known facts about Lakatos pretty well. It is the reality that is appalling, not the words describing it. According to Cadvany, it was actually Bernard Williams, the preeminent British moral philosopher, who once described Lakatos as a kind of a thug. Someone might say that, in terms of the main theme of this book, in Lakatos's case, it was more the heart, rather than reason, that went on holiday. There is some truth to this. Yes, a certain cold-heartedness, to put it very mildly, is evident in some of the episodes described above. This is additionally corroborated in judgments from acquaintances and commentators who said, among other things, that he was evil, Joseph Agassi, philosopher and colleague, that he was an impossible infantile monster, completely unable to understand other people, a former girlfriend, that he was not fully human, that his drives and his mind are in place but the rest missing, a mathematician colleague, that people did not matter to him, that he was a truly satanic figure, and that it was scary to see him in action, a historian colleague, that he was diabolic, philosopher Agnes Heller, that he was seen as an evil spirit and demonic. Endra Sagvari, a communist activist, that he was diabolic in his total disregard for people, Istvan Marcus, a journal editor, that he was like the devil, absolutely inhuman, that he had no human feelings for anyone, and that he would trample on anyone to get ahead. Andras Nagy, professor of economics, that he was a satanic figure, an editor Zoltan Jamboki, that he was unbelievably unscrupulous, Pater Nameth, a literary historian, that he met the criteria for antisocial personality disorder in the current DSM-4. All in all, a lot of the evidence points to the possibility that Lakatos was a psychopath, which is indeed how he was described by Dr. Clara Majerski, who worked at the National Psychiatric and Neurological Institute in Budapest and who knew Lakatos personally before the war won. On the other hand, though, such a radical deficit of empathy would certainly not be incompatible with a cognitive failure. And there is some evidence for that, too. Sticking with the superego. Needless to say, there was nothing inherently irrational about adopting the Marxist ideology and becoming a member of the Communist Party during World War II in Hungary, especially for someone like Lakatos, whose closest family members were persecuted and eventually perished in the Holocaust. But the fact that he kept the true Stalinist faith until 1956, as he apparently did, is much harder to understand, particularly given his indisputable intellectual brilliance as well as his easy access to information that was unavailable to others. From 1953 until his departure from Hungary in 1956, Lakatos worked in a library where he could freely read a lot of sources that were strictly forbidden to the public including books of his later teacher and prominent anti-Marxist, Karl Popper. Yet, in a 1971 letter to the psychologist Paul Meal, Lakato says that the Communist Party was his last superego, and that it was only in 1956 that he finally got rid of that superego. He is not more specific about the time when this happened, but one Lakato scholar dates his break with the party to the autumn of 1956. This is embarrassingly late if we remember that the Soviet tanks rolled into Budapest on October 24, 1956. 
let us telegraphically review a sequence of excellent but strangely missed opportunities for Lakatos to recognize the monstrosity of the regime that he had so faithfully served for years. When in 1947, some leading members of a non-communist party that had won the first election in post-war Hungary were accused by the communist minister of internal affairs, Laszlo Reich, of plotting against the state and were then either executed or given long prison sentences. Wasn't that very odd? Wasn't that a clear reason to have doubts about what one's superego was really up to? And when two years later that same Laszlo Reich was officially tried and soon executed for being a Titoist spy, an agent of Western imperialism, and for trying to restore capitalism and undermine Hungary's independence, didn't all this raise at least some suspicion about what was really going on? And if not, why not? Also, didn't Lakatos's terrible three-year experience of being illegally imprisoned in a labor camp and leaving that place of abuse with broken and missing teeth move him to start harboring some distrust toward the party that obviously stood behind that experience? Apparently not, because even after his release, Lakatos defended his own internment, saying the party must have had some good reason for what it did. And if, as Solzhenitsyn said, Marxism in the Soviet Union has fallen to such a low point that it has become a joke, an object of contempt, and that no serious person, not even university and high school students, can talk about Marxism without a smile or a sneer. How is it possible that a genius with a doctorate in philosophy too took seriously the official ideology that was drenched in the tired and ridiculous rote formulas of dialectical materialism? Paradoxically, this was the man who had such a penetrating mind that in London in 1961, he wrote a thesis that would soon be universally regarded as a stunningly original and highly influential contribution to philosophy of mathematics. But just five years earlier, this same man was still incapable of extricating himself from the clutches of a totally ludicrous philosophical doctrine or distancing himself from the manifestly inhumane political regime that was based on that ideology. And to make matters worse, according to a letter from MI5 October 10, 1962, to the Home Office, Lakatos, who was then already a lecturer at the London School of Economics, was still collaborating with the Hungarian secret police. This is apparently why his application for British citizenship was refused. He tried again in 1967, this time garnering the support of luminaries like Sir Karl Popper, who assured the British authorities that Lakatos had broken with his communist past before he left Hungary, and the LSE economist Lord Lionel Robbins, who called Lakatos a man of outstanding qualities of intellect and character. But the request was refused again. Home Secretary Roy Jenkins approached Lord Robbins and explained that the negative decision was made after full and careful consideration. Clearly, there must have been powerful evidence behind the refusal, but its nature was never as much as hinted at. Another puzzling thing touched on earlier is the tendency of some of the most prominent Lakatos-related sources today to omit compromising information about him, or even sometimes to twist it so that it appears less unfavorable. In some sense, this is understandable, for if one is receiving, and especially if one is bestowing, a coveted award named after X, one will naturally be reluctant to loudly announce to the world that X was in fact an ultra-Stalinist and a secret police informer, or that X was assisting the party apparatchiks in their ideological attacks on fellow philosophers, and that he was directly responsible for the cruel and pointless death of an innocent and vulnerable young woman. Nevertheless, hushing up or de-emphasizing this kind of biographical information is surprising. Would philosophers be equally cagey about mentioning or reacting to such publicly accessible information about one of their own if it turned out he had done something similar to what Lakatos had, with the only difference being that he was in the service not of Stalin, but say, Franco, Pinochet, or Hitler? To ask that question is to answer it. A striking contrast. Lakatos's real-life actions that caused loss of life and immense human suffering have barely produced a yawn among philosophers. Meanwhile, in another case, top scholars in the profession have issued strident condemnations and repeatedly expressed disbelief and shock over what one old and disillusioned man had written in the last year of his life 
in his private diary, which was published 70 years after his death. Another pertinent example is the German philosopher Gunter Fagal, who recently stepped down as the chair of the Martin Heidegger Society after learning about the appalling extent of Heidegger's anti-Semitism, which has been revealed in the newly published Black Notebooks of Heidegger. In an interview in the Badische Zeitung, Fagal said this discovery was a compelling reason for him to rethink his relation to Heidegger as a person, and added, the ever more pressing question for me was the following. Do I want, with my core beliefs, to be associated with this person? And the answer was a clear no. In a further development, these recent discoveries have caused so much embarrassment that the University of Freiburg has abolished Heidegger's former chair and, the ultimate insult, replaced it with a junior professorship in analytic philosophy. Although this reaction is regarded by some philosophers as excessive, it shows that, as a matter of fact, many do feel an irresistible impulse to disassociate themselves from the name of anyone who plunged so deeply into political irrationality and totalitarian insanity. Again, I am not supporting this impulse, but just registering its existence and its apparently wide appeal on some occasions, but notably not on others. Although the cases of Heidegger and Lakatos are similar in an important way, each of them played an active, infamous role in an odious political regime of his own country. They are, of course, very different in many respects. So I am not suggesting that our reactions to their misdeeds should necessarily be the same. But something else is also worth stressing. Differences between the two cases are not always in Lakatos's favor. After all, Heidegger is not known to have been directly responsible for anyone's death. 